What's going down, man? It's your boy, Donnie Houston. Want to let y'all know about a brand new black-owned firearm company right here out of Texas, right here out of Port Arthur, Solitaire Diamond Cut Firearms. Solitaire Diamond Cut Firearms, man. Listen, they have the best prices. You're not going to find anybody to beat these prices. And they have everything, all your favorite handguns, your favorite shotguns, your favorite rifles, optics, all your accessories. Anything you need that's regarded to firearms sdk firearms got you i'm telling you these are the best prices and you know when you make your order hey man tell them donnie houston sent you and uh you know it may be something else in there for you so sdkfirearms.com man i'm telling you you cannot beat these prices it's black owned it's based right here out of texas right here out of port arthur but you don't have to live in port arthur or texas to order from them they ship from everywhere around the country the customer service is amazing the prices can't be beat the turnaround time is extremely fast. Listen, man, sdkfirearms.com. Go there today and get whatever you need for all your firearm needs, man. Tell them Donnie Houston sent you, and it's going down. If you own one of these, I'm, not, I'm new to this. Apple Watch, yeah, I got one. Yeah. So when it when it shows that that uh the red uh lightning bolt, that means it's dead. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to laugh, but nah, it's it's funny because I had to figure mine out too. Okay, yeah, yeah I'm new to this shit. You know, I wasn't gonna get one. I was all against getting one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was too, and I got sucked in, and it's just like one. You know, Apple they get you. Oh yeah. Once you get one thing, it was. I used to be against iPhone. MacBook, all that. And I got an iPad, and I got an iPhone, and yeah. I got a MacBook Pro, I got an Apple Watch, and I was like, oh, all this shit can work together? Like, oh, I'm yeah. never going back. Yeah. See, I, I've been with the Apple product. I, I got started, man, my first uh, laptop and computer with, with Apple. Hmm. So I've been an Apple head from day one. How long ago was this? Shit. It had to have been like uh, 99, 2000, oh, something like that. Yeah. So I was like, you know, when I started using those, and then to go to Windows, it was foreign to me. It's like I couldn't navigate it at all. You know what I'm saying? But then I had several little uh, Android product. Mm -hmm. I couldn't navigate that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, but, you know, uh, I just was against this because it's it's attached to your a pulse and shit like mm -hmm. that. So it can monitor that. And I was just all against it for a while. I said, I don't need the motherfucker just knowing you Every little thing I got doing. Every little thing I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? Then they could be tied into the supercomputer and they could probably could manipulate that, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I just trust the most high career and say, well, shit, the weapon form, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. shit, that's what I'm on, bro. Yeah, yeah. Subscribe to the Danny Houston podcast, man. Boy, it's your boy Moby Dick, you know what I'm saying? The infamous from Beast by the Pound, formerly of No Limit Records, you know what I mean? See, man, I had a great time right here with the Donnie Houston show, you hear me, man? My brother from another mother, man, in Houston, man. Speaking of Houston, bro, I say, bro, I can't say much about Houston. I mean, say enough about Houston, bro. Houston, I got family here, you know what I'm saying? And I got a whole lot of love, man. Shout out to Chantre, shout out to Damon, shout out to Janky Joe, N.O. Joe, you know what I'm saying? Number love. Y'all might fuck around and have a whole nother resume. Peace out to you. Yeah, man, it's going down. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. Uh, I say this all the time. We got a special guest, but we got a real special guest. You know what I mean? With this being the 50th hip hop anniversary, um, you can't talk about 50 years of hip hop without talking about No Limit Records. You can't talk about No Limit Records without Beast by the Pound. You can't talk about Beast by the Pound without talking about Moby Dick, man. It's an honor to have him here. Moby, how you doing, man? Oh, man. Praise due to the most high creator, man. I'm here, man, to be the great Donnie Houston, man. You know what I'm saying? I heard a lot about you, man. I watched a couple of your podcasts, man. And, um, for 50th year of hip hop, man, to be in Houston, you know what I'm saying, this day. Uh, a lot of my constituents, man, through a uh, female by the name of Chantre, uh, my boy Damon, man, uh, Joe, Janky Joe, you know what I'm saying, it's my network out here. I have to send shots out to them. And actually, res definitely respect to 
the man, you know what I'm saying, Jay Prince. You know, we go back, you know what I'm saying, rest in peace, uh, Pimp Seed, my brethren, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's a great and honor to be here. I came out here to promote my book, you know mm. what I'm saying, the Moby Dickopedia, which tells about, you know, my journey in hip-hop and music period and how I got to know Limit, you know what I'm saying? So, mm. great honor to be here. What what I mean, we like you said, I was gonna, I was gonna start with that, the Moby Dickopedia. What made you say right now is the time to, to put the book out? Well, I had been uh dipping and dabbing with it for some years. Uh and I was thinking about my intention was to put out a documentary, you know what I'm saying? And uh my cousin Rainy Alivas, shout out to Rainy, man, my first cousin from Thibodeau, Louisiana, he said Cuz, man, you should do a book, man, with your experience and your, you know, your accolades and all that. You should do a book about your experience, man, especially with no, with no limit. And I just put it on the back burner because my, my focus, you know, sometimes I can get tunnel vision. But then I find out later that, you know, the best way to, if you want to put out anything in the film world, is to write a book. Most of your blockbuster movies come from books, you know what I'm saying? So... I went on and switched that focus and that energy and put it into the book, got it done, and um, finally got it done and published uh, this past year. So I figured that my story was interesting enough to be a readable and also not, you know, more than a, 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 a I ain't gonna say more than, but as well as a, a, a documentary. You know? mm. Man, but tell me, you know, um, you know, Coming from, we know no limit, but before we get to that, you know, tell me about you coming up in Louisiana, because you're not from New Orleans specifically, right? Nah, I'm from a place called Morgan City, Louisiana. Mm. Uh, the late great uh, Geronimo Pratt, mm. when he would have been, when, he, when I met him, um, he knew me before I knew myself. He was going by the name of Geronimo G. Java, because he tied that to the G. Java tribe in uh, Ghana. But uh, Morgan City, it's an industrial town, you know what I'm saying? I speak about that in the book, where uh, shrimp and petroleum, you know, just close in proximity to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of businesses and services are surrounded that surrounded by that. And, this, is, uh, this is in Louisiana, where, where about? Like, is it southwest? Where is it, like, where is it close to, would you say? I would say south, more south central. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because the way, I'm glad you asked that great, great question. It's uh, approximately 80 miles due south of Baton Rouge. Mm. 80 miles due west of New Orleans. Mm. And about 75 miles due east of Lafayette, Louisiana. So my mom is from Sunset. You know about Sunset? Oh, wow. That's about yeah. that's by Lafayette, the yeah. Caniana yeah. Pack. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. yeah, man. So and that, so you pretty much got to be familiar area. with that. Yeah. You're familiar yeah. with that. Yeah. So, man, you know... Um, uh, when I was young, man, you know, we were raised on a lot of family values. So, you know, that you mind being from Sunset, we were raised on family values that took took me the distance, man. I just made 58 July 4th. You know what I'm saying? I never would have guessed it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, oh, God is great, man. But to live that long was based on what, how I was raised, man. And we was raised with a tight-knitted community, tight -knitted community in St. Saint, Saint, I mean, I'm sorry, St. Mary Parish. But uh, Syracuseville subdivision, that's the little tight knit community that I was raised in. And uh, I learned a lot about community service in there. I learned about education and stuff and how important education is, you know what I'm saying? So that pushed me forward to college, you know what I'm saying? Ultimately, I was in a band, you know what I'm saying? From fifth grade all the way to college. And that experience down there, raised on crawfish and, you know what I'm yeah, saying, yeah. and good old food, the best food in the world, man. I mean, it's nothing like it. Cause when I went abroad, you know, when I went to Kansas, moved to Kansas and stuff for some years, I found out some things that those people wouldn't, uh, didn't have the privilege or the, the uh, have, was fortunate enough to raise how I was being raised, you know what I'm saying? Nothing against them, nothing to put them down, but yeah, that experience, man, helped me to become the person that I am, bro. So were you, were you getting into music? How early do you start getting into music and all that? Uh, I would say as early as, as I was conceived mm. in a womb. Because I come from a, a family that was musically oriented. Talk about it in that book too, you know what I'm saying? 
So uh yeah, uh being my grandfather was the uh uh chief music musician in uh Mount Pilgrim Baptist Church. He was a, a music minister. And ultimately I became a music minister in the church, you know what I'm saying? So I just been musically, that's just I've tried different things. I played basketball, this in a book in high school briefly. I wasn't the best, you know what I'm saying, but I made the team, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, I was deep into the sciences as well. But music gets me, man, real talk. Mm. So music always has been me. Mm. So you say high school, but after that, you end up going to college. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what were you going to college? I know you went two different places. What was the first place you went to? First one uh, really was Southern. Mm. But I talk about it in the book once again. But some unfortunate circumstance happened. And I had to uh, drop out and uh, start again the next semester at Nickel State University. It's in Thibodeau, Louisiana. And uh, I went back and back to Southern because I always wanted to be in that band. Southern that band. That legendary band, man, to this day. Yeah. Bruh, yeah. the best band in the land, man. So I, I made the band in um, 86, you know what I'm saying? So. And what, what were you playing in the band? Mellophone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matter of fact, this is the 50th year of the uh, of the. Uh, Bayou Classic this year, mm. 50, 50 years. I mean, also crazy, 50 years of hip hop, the same time, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So yeah. yeah, shout out to the Jukebox, and shout out to Grambling too, you know, all those great HBCU bands and all bands. I also uh, played in Nickel State Band as well. Mm. That's where I played uh, Kappa Kappa Psi, uh, 80th, 80th Theta chapter in 1986. Yeah. Mm. Kappa Kappa Psi is a national honorary band. For yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, you're doing that, but then you have to leave college and you go off to the service? Yeah, because I got kicked out. Doc set me out. We had a little incident, you know, a little... Wait, wait, so what, what, got you, what, what got you kicked out? Well, a little scrimmage, a little scrap, you know what I'm saying, that happened, and uh, ultimately it got back to Doc. Oh. Zipped me, zipping me, and he kicked us out of the band, me and another one of my fraternity brothers, man. And, um, and uh, I didn't want to tell mom, so I wound up... Uh, enlisting in the Navy Reserve and wound up going to San Diego. You know, I, I used to not tell mom a lot of stuff because... You went to that extreme I to say, I'm going to go to the service. <laughs> yes, sir. Mama wasn't playing. <laughs> yeah, you know, mom and dad weren't playing. We had this household rule that, hey, especially in Morgan City, a little town like Morgan City where everybody knew everybody, don't shame the household name. You know, Don't make me shame. They used to tell us all the time. Don't go out there and make me shame. You remember that? Don't go out there and make me shame. So we live by that. That was golden. Mm -hmm. That was my golden rule. So that's what, how I wound up in San Diego. You know what I'm saying? NTC, RTC, San Diego, yeah. So how long did you end up doing doing that? Well, I was there for um, three years. Yeah. Then I got a, a, a other than honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's in the book. Y'all going to find a lot of that in there. Yeah. And then you come back and you go to what school did you go after that when you came out? Wichita State. Wichita, yeah, yeah. Wichita State. So why, why Wichita? Well, Wichita, I got into a little, which in the book again, I got into a little, it was around in the Reaganomics era, Reaganomics and uh, Bush. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't a lot of jobs out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and I can say it was done by design, by systemically done by design to where uh, George Jobs wasn't plentiful, but the streets were, yeah, yeah. and the jails were too, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So they worked hand in hand. So uh, I, I knew that in hindsight, you know what I'm saying? But while I was younger, I just wanted to get to the money, you know what I'm saying? Got in a little trouble, you know what I'm saying? Strike one, strike two, you know what I'm saying? Then strike, two, strike three came, I said I had to relocate, you know what I'm saying? So the option was, hey, you go do this boot camp thing, or you can go to college, you know what I'm saying? Go back to college, like, they look at your record, you know what I'm saying, and see, you know, what your history was. So I chose to uh, go with my cousin, Alton Gettery Chubb Gettery to, uh, to Wichita, Kansas, because he had a football scholarship. And I went up there to see what it was like. I like what I seen, because there was more opportunity up there to uh, better myself and get myself out of that environment. And it changed my life. Mm. Yeah. So you say you say it changed your life in, in what ways? What was it, what was the changes in that? The change, once again, is in that book. Uh, one, you know, so we like I said, the 50th year of uh, 
not only hip hop, but Bayou Classic. Every year that you know, you know about the Bayou Classic, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's a, uh, it was the biggest game, pretty much to me in HBCU between the, the black HBCUs, the biggest ones who had football programs between Southern and Gramlin. And uh, in 1994, me and my fraternity brothers, shout out to the Cubes, we um, we assembled and got with some other chapters in the area. So we had a descent to go down to the Bayou Classic and uh, we made a pit stop in Dallas, right? So that's, that's a 14 hour drive, man. You know what I'm saying? From Wichita, Kansas mm. to New Orleans. So we made, the halfway point was Dallas. Got to Dallas and um, went to this little club called The Spot. Drew Pearson, it was his club. And we had some frat brothers that was there. And, um, that was uh, working at the club. So we got in there and um, inadvertently ran into, to make a long story short, ran into my cousin, Master P. Mm. He recognized me. I hadn't seen him like in since about two two to six years. I don't know, you know, the time frame has been that long ago. But anyway. Um, Is he in the club doing music or he just happened to be there partying he, and he kicking would, it in? No, he was actually promoting for the, uh, the album that he had out at that time. I think it was uh, uh, Ghetto Trying to Kill Me, something like that, High for Christmas and all that type of stuff. And uh, he noticed me you know, from afar, I think, yeah, from the DJ booth. And um, my frat brother saw him point me, pointing at me, trying to, telling him to get my attention. So I turned around, I saw it was him. So it was like a family reunion, like, like what you doing in here? You know what I'm saying? So then he gave me the... Uh, an invite to go to California because he actually he already knew all, everybody in the family knew about me being a musician. You know what I'm saying? He asked me if I was still doing my music, and he said, "Well, look, you know, my cousin doing it because I had already knew prior to that the last time I seen him that he was into doing music. You know what I'm saying? Of running a record label, No Limit. So he gave me an invite there. I took him up on that invite. The rest is history." That's crazy. So, what are you doing? Are you doing anything musically, production wise? Like, what are you doing prior to meeting Master P? Are you messing around with anything, or this is just you running to your cousin and you happen to have the skill, and he like, all right, well, come out here and you know help me put this thing together. Great question. That answers in that book again. But I, I, we gonna we gonna get the book, y'all. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just book, saying, yeah, you're not wrong, a lot of stuff. No, no, I'm just saying. But the book is on Amazon. Let's let's do that right now. But they need no, to that. that book is in. Yeah, it is on Amazon, but. I have it also on my uh, website, victorianaforms.com. Yeah, great one. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I had a label, me and my cousin on my uh, maternal side. Uh, we had a record label called Starving Artists at the time. And, uh, you know, matter of fact, we met uh, UGK through that later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we were big fans of UGK. But anyway, um But you said y'all met him later on through that label? Yeah, through uh, through that label, Starving Artist Entertainment. Cause I, I matter of fact, I'm one of the uh founders of that label. So we were partners in that. Hmm. But uh when I left and went to Kansas, then you know, I let him run on keep one hundred percent of it. But we I said, Well, if you want anything from me, I got you, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, uh yeah, I had that label going on at that time, you know what I'm hmm. saying? Also, our manager was my frat brother, Ernest Wood, on Ernest Walters, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man. So, I already had that going. So, I had knowledge of the business. I already had my publishing and all that type of stuff because, you know, I had this, anything that I do, being a college student, I want to do my thorough research and my due diligence on it. So, I made sure I had my business straight. So, yeah, by the time I met him, you know, all that was all in place. Mm -hmm. So, you get out to California, and when you get, to, when you get there... What does No Limit look like? What's the artist over there? Like, who's running the production prior to you getting there? Like, what, what's kind of going on at the time? Uh, at that time... Uh, and this is 94, you said? That was 94. Yeah. Uh, he was getting a lot of production from a guy by the name of K. Lou. Yeah. K. Lou, also Al Eaton, uh, who did a lot of work for Too Short. And uh, K. Lou was doing a lot of stuff for E-40 and, you know, Sebo and all that. Had that bass sound. Yeah, he had that, yeah, that big area sound. And uh, uh, E-40, Al Eaton, E-8 Ski was doing a lot of his work at the time. 
but that but he was you know doing those work for hire. He didn't have an in house production team. Uh, but uh, Mia X was already up there. He had sent for her. You know you know she's from New Orleans. For Big Ed, rest in peace, Big Ed. Uh, Silk was there, uh, and C was back and forth from New Orleans. You know what I'm saying? So those were the artists that he had in house there. You know what I'm saying? And he was just hitting them streets real hard, man. P was hustling that hit behind off out there. Yeah, mm. So that that was the scenario. So when you get there, are you coming to be like the, the the main producer at that time, or is he like bringing in other people as you're coming in to help on production as well? Well. Yeah, I guess his idea was to just see what happens when he sent for me. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if he knew that in his head that he wanted that wanted to develop an uh, in-house production. But what I do remember is that when KL came up there a couple of weeks later, KLC, shout out to KLC. Did you know him prior to him coming or that's how y'all I did? had met him prior to that mm. when uh, our group Critical Condition, which later became CC Waterbound, we had, like I'm saying, we had our record label. KL had his record label. He had him and uh, this guy by the name of Dart, you know what I'm saying? They had the Three Nine Posse, and they were producing for like Lil Elton and other people, Serve On, you know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, who else? Uh, Mr. Cool, he did some work for them in his early days. But anyway, uh, we both had our own little record labels and stuff like that locally in New Orleans and Morgan City. And there was a show that was at our uh, is at our center. We had a, a recreational center where we should do a lot of parties and shows in Morgan City, Syracuseville to be exact. And we met there, so that's that's how we had met prior to re meeting again in um, in the Bay Area. So P had heard about him, and Servon had bought him, you know, to P through his affiliation with. See murder because him they play basketball, you know, in some leagues in the, um, in New Orleans, and that's how KL wound up there. So when he came up there, we had seen each other. Was like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we met. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? So then I saw that we were gonna be occupying the same space. I proposed the idea. I say, say, man, what you think about? In team, bro. You know what I'm saying? Let's put since we're gonna be in the same spot. I'm I'm not into this competition stuff, man. Let's let's put our talents together and create a team. He said, Yeah, I'm with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, What are we gonna call ourselves? I say, uh, yeah, we got pounds and pounds of beasts that be pounding. Hmm. Let's call ourselves beasts by the pound. He said, Ooh, yeah. I say, yeah, I like that. So we ran with it, you know what I'm saying? And then it started with us two, and then uh, a couple of months later, Servon was bringing more beats up there from some people that he knew from uptown, Craig B, you know what I'm saying, Mia, bought some stuff that she was um, messing with Odell, you know, by her affiliation with Manny Fresh. Odell was Manny Fresh keyboard player. Mm. So that, you know, that, uh, dun, 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 mm -hmm. that was him playing those keys on there for Drag Him in the River. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was oh, old no there. You know what I'm saying? So Mia X brought him to the table. P already had an affiliation with um, Carlos, you know, um, and he came later by way of P's, you know, you know, asked us if he wanted us, we wouldn't mind bringing him to the table. And that completed the puzzle. Yeah. So when y'all putting this thing together, what's, what's everybody's strengths in it? Or could y'all, everybody kind of do the same? You know, everybody was good at, Everything and it just what you fall in where you fall in. Nah, uh, like you actually, say Odell was good with the keys. Oh yeah, I know I, KLC had the drums. The drum, sure. yeah, yeah, absolutely, the drums and bringing the horns and stuff like that. Uh, me, I came with. I did a lot of interpolations where I could play stuff that sound like the record. You know what I'm saying? And by me being a, a musician and a band, a band smith and also a church organist, because I was playing for. Matter of fact, when I saw P in Dallas, I was playing for a church in Wichita, Kansas. So I was a, a minister of music and also the youth, the youth uh, music minister for that church and also the church organist, you know what I'm saying? And Odell was also a church organist too. Uh, Carlos, you know, he, you know, he had good gift with, with the keys and he had some good melodic stuff going on. Craig B, he had some good funk stuff going on, you know what I'm saying? He had 
he had a lot of good funk grooves and bass lines. And yeah, we just, a lot of stuff we had in common, a lot of stuff we had strengths, you know. So that's maybe, that was maybe Spot the Pound, that, that collection. Man, so what's the first major project? Project is it uh, Down South Hustlers or like what? What's the first thing that y'all really start to kind of get on? It was, it would say, I would say the Ice Cream Man. Ice Cream Man. Ice Cream Man. Ice Cream Man was before the uh, before the Down South. Oh part? yeah, Ice Cream Man was like ninety six, ninety seven, and Down South Hustlers came around after that. And mm. then also we had Silk the Shocker. That's that Shocker album. Mm. And we had other albums like um, uh, Trey Eight, you know what I'm saying? That album right there, um, when, when I did the track with Fright Night on there, mm. you know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, it's a lot of albums, a lot of work. Man, even, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Even before we even heard everything, like you said, yeah, I was already yeah, putting that work like that. that. So, okay, take me to Ice Cream Man. You know, just building that, the song, first of all, then we'll go to the album. Like, who brings that that to the table to say, we're going to take the, the uh, what was Dre and them doing with that? With the Michelle and all that. Cause that's basically what it is, right? The, uh, oh, yeah. The doom, 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 oh, yeah. Doom, it was um, doom, doom, doom. actually before that, it, it comes from a group called, okay, it comes from New Birth. It hmm. comes from New Birth. Hmm. New Birth is called Been, Been Such a Long Time. Been such a long time since I saw you. Is that, that's where they get it from. You know, new birds, man. So that's the ones that made that up. Now let it fly. Oh, she's a lady. Mm -hmm. Now that, what they call mm -hmm. that shit, uh, Wildflower. Mm -hmm. Same band, you know what I'm saying? So they got it from there. So, and then from there, uh, but to turn down the light, that was, you know, uh, the Michelle lay on, uh, I With think. The Wrecking it, Crew and all that. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Wrecking Crew. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, P, you know, he got, I think, he got the idea from my point of view that, you know, when Ice Cube was doing the uh, jacking for beats, remember that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and sampling was big, you know, in, that, in those days to where they would do interpolations and stuff like that. But P already had that record going, you know what I'm saying, by the time I got there. K. Lou was already doing the production, you know what I'm saying, the music to it. But then he told me, say, Cuz, put something on there. You know, he wanted me to just get in there, you know, get involved, you know what I'm saying, so I could get some credits behind me. So I did. I did my thing and started playing some chords, and so we added that to that, you know what I'm saying? And um, and while they were writing, while P was writing his part and Mir was writing his part, you know what I'm saying, uh, he he told Mia what to sing. So she was singing her part, you know, she was doing pretty much like uh, um, her own version. Of what Michelle did. Michelle A was doing. Yeah. So she was like the, the Michelle A of that, you know what I'm saying? Because she could sing too. And then when she was singing that, I'm just singing on the side, which I'm filling the gap. Mr. Ice Cream can, can you hit that? Can you hit it? Huh? Can you hit the Mr. Ice Cream Man? Can I hit it? Can you hit the Mr. Ice Cream Man? What you mean, can I, can I sing it? Yeah. Mr. Ice Cream Man. Mr. Ice Cream Man. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. still got it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Boy, it's kind of hard because I've been out all <laughs> night, all weekend and stuff like that, and barking with the bros, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. my boy's kind of like horse, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, yeah, dude, yeah, that's that's what happened. Um, and that's, that became Mr. Ice Cream Man. And it's crazy, man. People, when I get introduced to people through the bros, oh, that's Mr. Ice Cream Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's Master P, but then that's a whole nother story with him and the loonies and all that type of mm -hmm. stuff. Nah, I'm not the ice cream man. I'm over dick. You hear me? I just sung that hook. Yeah. Yeah. You say I'm Moby Dick. Where you get your name and say I'm gonna call myself Moby Dick? Cause that, that's no part of your to, a part of your real name. Oh no. Yeah. He's on that again. What part of that <laughs> story? <laughs> I'm gonna go on remote. But yeah, but the, here's a, uh, the summarized version. Um. Um. They just call me Dick in the Hood. And at the time, uh, when, you know, I had several uh, names that I went by, several, uh, what they call them, aliases and stuff. When I was doing my music in the earlier day, you know, when I was cool jazz, ambassador, smooth scholar, and all that stuff, you know, because I was with the conscious stuff and all that. But then by the time I got to No Limit, 
Uh, my cousin had asked me, "Cuz, what you what you go by? What your name? You know what I'm saying? What well, we gonna call you when we put it on a, on the album cover and in the credits?" I said, "You know, that's a good question." Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In my head. So I went off the top. I had to I had to think real quick, right? He said, "Well, they called me Dick at the crib." You know what I'm saying? And uh, so I miss meant to scrap him. Moby Dick. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I, I had to spell it different. The Mo B. What did the Mo B stand for? Mo better. That comes because a lot of people, when I was in college, say, man, you know, you look like Spike Lee. You remind me of Spike Lee. The fuck? Oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> you remind me of Spike. So, but my favorite Spike Lee movie was Mo Better Blues. You know what I'm saying? So I took the Mo B, the Mo Better, and turned it into Mo B as a, a short for Mo Better. You know what I'm saying? And added to Dick. Then you got it. Voila. See, I'm a, I ain't gonna lie. See, you you the first Moby Dick I knew. I, I had to find out Moby Dick was a whale or some type of shit later <laughs> on. Like later, I ain't know that shit. I'm like, nigga, Moby Dick, nigga, that's no limit. What y'all just talking about? about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, you know what's crazy? And I'm glad you asked that. I'm gonna say this shit on this show right now. Okay. My name had been plagiarized. Yeah. Let's get a little messy right now. I'm saying. I've been, I called myself Moby Dick since uh, 1995. I, the same spelling and all that. Here comes a drag king. No disrespect to, you know, the that transgender, and all that. no disrespect to that. This is not a jab at that. But I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of and speaking in terms of plagiarism. Uh, so now when you Google Moby Dick, this person should. Same spelling and everything. <laughs> Drag king and all this type of stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, wow, okay. So I look it up under the uh, the trademark. Yeah. She went on and trademarked the name in 2019. Got to it before you got to it. Yeah, got to it. I wasn't even thinking, but so, you know, it is what it is. She beat me to the punch, but I'm still rolling with it. Yeah. No, nah, like I say, I don't. It's only one Moby Dick I know. I had to learn about the, the whatever the real, the original. You know what I'm saying, Moby yeah, Dick? Yeah, now, yeah. but yeah, it's about Moby Dick. You talking about no limit, nigga? Master P, them. I don't know. What he's yeah, talking yeah. About. And, and it's the thing in two different contexts. A lot of people thought it was something had to do with yeah. You got a big penis and all this type of stuff. No, I ain't got nothing to do with none of that. Oh, more you know better. What I'm saying? Yeah, oh. more better. You know, and they call me Dick. You know, I'm keeping it real with people who knew me and. Uh, that was a term of endearment for me. Yeah, what's up, Dick? You know what I'm saying? That was my name in the hood. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so mm. that's what that is. Man, so y'all drop ice cream, man. Now you're on the radio with this thing, man. Mm -hmm. is, is is your life changing or y'all still grinding out at, at this particular life? I mean, this particular this Well, I definitely changed. I'm on this show, right? Mm. Because of that. You mm. know what I'm saying? And, uh, oh, yeah, it's changed, changed drastically. And basically, we're doing the highlight of that, you know, during the, the big, the No Limit era, when No Limit was No Limit, that was the, the household thing. And people were going to the store every Tuesday, you know what I'm saying? So it got to a point to where, you know, especially me being on on TV and stuff like that and singing these hooks and stuff. And, uh, and they noticing me once I go to these grocery stores, you know what I'm saying? You know, I feel, so I'm from this all off Mr. Ice Cream, man. Yeah, yeah. Not just, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm just saying one. at that point, at that yeah, area. That was yeah, the one, yeah, because yeah. that was the song that really got it going. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that song there was really the ch got on the charts and stuff like that. That album was what it was and is what it is. And uh, people start, you know, started noticing me, you know, before I knew it. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, damn, hold on. I can't go to the grocery store like talking about them because they're going to be coming. Oh, that's him. So, you that's know, Mr. Ice Cream, man. Yeah, that's him. That's that dude, you know, that's Moby Dick, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, you know, before I knew it, I became Moby Dick, you know what I'm saying? And people knew who I was, and next thing you know, I'm in the Source magazine, credits and all this, and, you know, vibe and stuff like that. So, yeah, it changed drastically. Yeah. And I got, you know, you know, appreciate y'all, man, everybody who been supporting through the years, man, you know, especially if you grew up in hip-hop that era, you know, you knew who No Limit was. And that respect and the accolades and the love that came from man is humbling to say the least. Bro. Mm. Yeah. Can you can you talk about the the idea behind the true album? Because there's so many bangers on there, man. Like that true album just got so much shit on it. Which that, one? Man. The double or the first one? The the uh the one with with I'm about it and I I mean not not I'm about it, no limit soldiers and 
Oh, yeah. Feds yeah. and, you know, all that. Uh, watching me, all that. That whole album. Oh, man. That one there, bro. Like, what was the idea to say we gonna do true? Like, what, what is that thing about? That's P. P, mm. P, P was a uh, genius, man, you know, in his own right. P was a genius. I mean, you could tell. I mean, he, he made history. And he's still in people's mouths and stuff like that. So P had, he was a visionary. And uh, when he was pushing out the records, you know what I'm saying, he, had, he was coming up with concepts for the album covers and stuff, not just for the album covers, for the actual albums to, to give it a theme. And we would uh, follow that theme and stay consistent with that theme. And when we got that artwork, because we usually got the artwork before we had even started the album, you know what I'm saying? So that artwork spoke to all of us and it got ingrained in us. And I could speak for myself, but my comrades who were around us, I could, see, I could tell the effect that was going on with the producers, you know what I'm saying? And um, so when that happened, but, um, you know, KL with that No Limit Soldiers, that's how it started. KL just, man, <laughs> bro, the snares, you know what I'm saying? That piano, dun, dun, all this shit. Yeah, bro. So he did that, man, and uh, everything followed suit up after that, man. And so all. that was the first record y'all worked on for that project? It didn't just fall as the I, first I record on I wouldn't necessarily album. say it was the first. I, you know, I, I could vaguely remember, but I, I know that was the first one that, that was in the track order. You know what I'm saying? But I remember when KL was working on it, it was, you know, real special, man. And uh, P, once P heard it, he told KL, don't put no more instruments in it. You know what I'm saying? He went straight to the booth. You know what I'm saying? He did his thing on it. You know what I'm saying? Pretty much, man, P, I don't know if y'all could tell, P freestyled pretty much everything he got on. Mm. <laughs> y'all could tell. You know what I'm saying? He freestyled everything. He did a real good job of it. You know what I'm saying? Because he put the energy to go in with it, man. And, uh, was it multiple takes in this, or he just going in there no. and whatever come to mind, he knocked that shit out no. and go to the next one? Could he, could he got to understand he wore more than one hat? He wasn't just a rapper, he was a CEO. Ooh. So he had, once he laid his verse, he'd go in the office and go, you know, make phone calls and do his thing in the business world, you know what I'm saying? So, and then you got to understand how we were putting those records out between 97 and 98. How many did we put out? About 26. 20, 23 in, in 98. See? Yeah. And how many, how many songs were on each album? At least 20. See? Yeah. So we didn't have time to do nothing. A lot of those songs weren't even fully mixed. That's what I was going to say. The mixes on some of them, boy, they real muddy. Like, at the time, you yeah. ain't really noticing that shit. Yeah. It's like, man, it's knocking. But you can go back and be like, yeah, they was running through the mix. Oh, yeah, bro. running through the mix. It, 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 it was a, it was what do you call that? A factory, a conveyor belt. You know what I'm saying? So we just putting them out. You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, the fans loved it. Because you got to think hip-hop, bro, one, once again. Especially in its infancy, you know what I'm saying? They had some that were records like the uh, Sugar Hill Gang and stuff like that. But then, like, you went, by the time you got to, like, uh, Duck Down, you know, from um, from New York, mm -hmm. and especially the Wu-Tang, they liked it muddy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those mixes were muddy to keep it gritty and, and give it that street feel, you know what I'm saying, that that that, that organic, the rawness. Audience, that mm -hmm. rawness. Mm -hmm. And I liked that, you know what I'm saying? You know, uh, uh, you know I was a... I am a, a Wu Tang fan. You know what I'm saying? I like those guys what they brought to the table. I guess they could say No Limit was the Wu Tang of the South because there's so many of us. You know what I'm saying? But shout out to the Ruzzers. Shout out, rest in peace, ODB. You know what I'm saying? Those guys I met, you know what I'm saying? Those are good guys, man. And, uh, you know, my, my favorite out of that clan was uh, 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 Ghostface Killer. You know I like Ghostface shit. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, man, that a lot of those songs, we, we had to just get it done, put it out, get it packaged. Put it in the store. Are hey, y'all in there all day? Like, how how these sessions going? Is this an everyday thing? Are y'all mapping out? You know, like, how is it going? Because to put stop. out that productivity was crazy. It didn't stop. Mm. We were taking shifts. Mm. Yeah, we were taking shifts. Um, you know, we had a, a, a AM shift. We had a PM shift that would go into the AM. You know what I'm saying? So, case in point, uh, me and Craig B would work the night shift. KL and uh, Odell would work the you know, the day shift, and we would, you know, flip flop it. And it would be time to where I, KL, man, you gonna go home? You know what I'm saying? Mm. You going home? Cause I would see him in there, he, could he, you know, he, you know, he's such a uh, uh, tunnel vision on this, to where he, once he get in there, he, he gets Locked caught in, in there, he, look, he, he in there, it's hard for him to snap out of that. You know, he's still like that to the day. Shout out to KL, that's my dude. Mm. Yeah, but we worked around the clock. 
That's how that happened. Bro. Was there any artist around there that just was that you remember who say, "Man, this was probably the hardest working person in the studio at the time." Oh man, I could go through some because we had some talent. Some people were bigger, different. I don't care. I don't give a fuck what they talking about. Hmm. You got people like Mac, Mill, Fiend, Slim, Mystical. So I'm saying, you know, I called him a go to them immediately. You know what I'm saying? And that's before, you know, no, no disrespect. I love Snoop because, you know, Snoop came later. He was already, had already. Uh, uh, he was who he was. Yeah, he was. He, he was Snoop when he came to us. You know what I'm saying? But our Raw, oh, yeah. Then we had some guy about like, full-blooded. He didn't get the, you know, the exposure that he needed, but he was one of the coldest ones on there. You know what I'm saying? We had some guys within the uh, Gambino family that was snappers. You know what I'm saying? Uh, within uh, Rest in Peace, uh, Fino. He gone, and also with a uh, prime prime suspect, rest, rest in peace, Canoe. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, man, we had some some go Cain and Abel. Don't sleep on them, <laughs> but but had some shit, bro. Talk about that gangster fire with that that album. Be sure, man. Naturally, mine, man. That's one of my favorite album. Be sure songs. Just keep it. Oh yeah. That so whole man. album really in effect mode is one of my favorite albums. Oh yes, just, indeed. You know, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, I, that was my favorite song from from him, The Natural Mind. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, when we got to by the time we got to Kane and Abel, once again, stories in that book. Did I bump the mic? But anyway, uh, they they came around what year? Do you remember? They came around '97. Mm. Yeah, they came around '97. They actually with a group called Double Vision, mm. Double Vision, and they were students at Xavier University. You know, they came with transplants from uh, New York. You know what I'm saying? And they came there and they just... Already, I ain't no okay kind neighbors from New York. Yeah, from New York, bro. You know what I'm saying? They doing movies right now. You know, them boy. you know, they, they into that thing. So very, very intelligent, you know, young men, man. Well, men are grown-ass men now, but at the time they were young men. And, uh, yeah, they came through there, man, and uh, they got dropped off by the studio because we had a studio... And uh, matter of fact, it was where Three Nine Posse, you know, KL's group was doing, it, and with their label was recording a lot of their music, and we were uh, working on a lot of stuff simultaneously. The, uh, we were working on the about it soundtrack and the movie, and the filming them, doing all that in tandem. At the what was that time. conversation like when people was like, "Hey, y'all, we finna do a movie"? Were y'all thinking like, "Okay, hey, let's go, you? fuck it, let's go, yeah, let's do it." Are you doing a movie? Okay, shit, fuck. You know what I'm saying? Was he yeah. always on that shit? Just talking about just doing, just really taking it there, going a the distance with you. I wouldn't necessarily say talk about it. P just fucked around and just did it. Hmm. I, I, he probably had it in know, his mind. Right? Well, he in wasn't talking mind. about it amongst y'all. He yeah. just showed up and hey, we doing a movie. Say, oh, yeah, we about to do a movie. <laughs> or he, he'll come out hypothetically in the uh, situation. Hey, stop what you're doing. We got some shit on the deck, some new shit that came in. Let's stop what you're doing. Let's do that. That's what happened. Actually, what happened with Kane and Neighbor. They stopped what y'all doing. Uh, uh, we got these twins. So uh, they came in there. We started working on the project, you know what I'm saying? And just, you know, organically just started doing stuff on a vibe, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I said, let's get these boys a record in my mind. I'm going to get these boys a nice little record. Like I said, I was the go-to guy for interpolations and remakes and stuff like that. So I did that one, and uh, shit, this shit became a hit, bro. Real Ooh. talk. Yeah, nah, that, that's a yeah, that's a, that's a classic, man. Already, that's yes, a classic. Man, talk about go back, going back to the true album. Then I always feel like somebody's watching. Pi idea, hmm. that pi idea. He came in and said, "Cut, I need you to do this." You know what I'm saying? Hmm. And I'm gonna do this record here. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, we started working on the beat. Matter of fact, I think that was the first, if not, it was either that one or Heaven for a Gangster that we did a Beast by the Pound collab. Heaven for a Gangster. Yeah. Gangster. So, but that one now, do, 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 do. that's me on the bass line, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so I, he said, so he said, build a song around that, you know what I'm saying? So, did that. And, uh, Who's on the Who's on the uh, on the scent on the on the lead? Ooh, ooh. That was Craig B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that and of course Kale on the drums. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, that that one that was uh, I didn't expect that to really do what it was going to do, but it did. You know what I'm saying? P had a uh, had a plan, and he had certain songs that he he really liked and and he wanted us to redo. 
he would he came to me he was like, yeah, cuz do this. And then we teamed up on the beat and it became what it was. Oh, okay. Then y'all go to Ghetto D. Was Ghetto D coming after that? What, what was, what's after the True album? Like That was the same year. Yeah, I think it was it was after that because he had already put out the Ice Cream Man. Yeah. So we go to the Ghetto D. Yeah, Ghetto D was pretty much, I guess, somewhere around. We put out a lot of albums that year. Uh, Ghetto D came out like 98, right? Maybe in the 97, somewhere in there. In the 97, somewhere around that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that Ghetto D. Because that's, wow. I feel like that, because that's the one that had make him say, oh, that's the one when it was like, oh, no, nah, it's just, if you don't know about No Limit, now you mm -hmm. know about No Limit. You know what I mean? Well, that project there, man, you know, my favorite between Ice Cream Man and, and Ghetto D is going to be that. It's going to be Ice Cream Man all day because of Raw. You know what I'm saying? When uh, Ghetto D became more commercialized, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Uh, but the song that I'm most emotional about on that album is going to be that Make Him Sing. Uh, Craig, like, yeah, KL, his real name is Craig. Mm -hmm. KL, Put his ass in it. He took the the dun, dun, chopped him yeah. the horn. Yeah, he he did his thing. Kel did his thing, and I remember that all those MCs, including P, P snapped on that motherfucker. Don't give a fuck with no Kicked person. it off. Yeah, that nigga snapped. Wasn't no better first verse. We're gonna <laughs> he, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food, I know, you know what I'm saying? Can't another motherfucking thing. He killed that bitch. But y'all in there wide when he was doing the shit, or y'all just like it's another no, day at the studio? No, it was a factory. It was another, another day at the office. Uh, P assembled the team, you know what I'm saying? Whoever was going to get on this motherfucker, you know. He already, Miska was a given. Mia was a given. Silk was a given. He was a given. But Fiend was one of those studio rats you couldn't get rid of. P, Fiend would be in that motherfucker like, okay, I'm going to get me. I'm going to get on this. I'm going to snap. I'm going to kill everything up in this motherfucker. So when it came down for, for Fiend's opportunity, he got on that and did his damn thing. Yeah. 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 Fiend, no yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah. I had Fiend on here. We ain't even had, I got to call Fiend. Yeah, I had yeah. that conversation. I ain't yeah, but Fiend did his thing, bro. And uh, so that right there became, to me, the, should I say, the bar raiser. Because you had all the MCs going on that motherfucker doing their thing, Mia holding it down for all the women in hip hop. But See, I, Mia don't get enough credit, I feel like. Bro. She one of the coldest, dog. I would say in my mind, not just because she's my sister, she's the coldest. Hmm. Real talk. Because she, think of her name, let's start with Mia X. Think about that. Hmm. She, she could have said anything. Why she put an X at the middle of her name? That came from someone. I will let her explain that. I'm not going to speak for her on that, but just the, the whole, her whole thought her mind process. Was, yeah. uh, where her mind was. So that would tell you right there. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, Mia, man, they all went for theirs, man, on that project, on, on that on that song, and it, and it set the pace for that album, bro. And then it went on to some other stuff, to some, you know. The, uh, Unpredictable uh, was right around that time, yeah. right? Yes. Indeed. Do you remember when Mystical showed up? Because Mystical oh, yeah, came man. from Big Boy. Yeah, he came there, so they worked a deal with that, you know what I'm saying? And I think they still did a partnership with Jive, you know what I'm saying? He had some obligations he had to do with them, so they worked it out some kind of way. And he was a perfect fit, bro. That dude, Unpredictable was one of my favorite albums. I can oh wrap that album from the start to the finish. You know what? I was in, I didn't produce no, nothing on that record. How you missed that one? I started working on uh, Gangsta Harmony. Mm. So I started putting more, you know, when I found out I was going to do an album, which was P's idea, I didn't know... I was gonna have an album come out. I guess it was a certain type of uh, feedback I was getting from that that the label was getting from you the know, hooks and all the that. fans and the hooks. Like so, next thing I know, I was at Pen and Pixel, you mm. know, on the piano with yeah. you. Yeah, so that's how I missed that album. But nevertheless, it came out how it was supposed to come out. Man, one of the best albums on the limit. Man, that boy there, you know, rest, uh, free mystical. You know what I'm saying? Free him, man, and. Uh, Keep him in your prayers and stuff like that, that he gets out and do what he's meant to be doing. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, man, that, you know, it's a lot of stuff came behind that, man. Uh, what else you had? The, life, uh, of, life or death, uh, C word. To do it, stay out my head, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I tell you, I was a fan. Listen, man, me and my boy, we used to, y'all was dropping so much, we would ride our bike to the store 
around the corner from the neighborhood. Like every weekend, every other weekend, we pick up something. I got a mid X story. I never forget. We were so big on y'all when uh, when Mama Drama dropped. It was oh, out man. around the same time as Juvenile 400 Degrees. Oh yeah. And you. Now, 400 Degrees wanted to be a classic, but at the oh, time, wow. it was only high and maybe like Soldier Rag. You know, he was still a new artist pretty much to us. Mm-hmm. He was locked in with No Limit. And we sat there, and we was like, all right, man, we're going to get this Juvenile album, or we're going to get this Mia X album. And we got Mama Drama, over 400 Degrees. Like, that's how, that's how serious we was about uh-huh, that No Limit. He wasn't man. disappointed either. Yeah, no, nah, not at all. <laughs> nah. Yeah, shout out to Juvenile, bro. The classic album, you know, one of the greatest albums of all time. One know? of my favorite MCs, too. I ain't gonna lie, one of my favorite groups, hip hop groups, was the Hot Boy. Hmm. Real talk, man, because they all them boys were snap, snapping. Welcome home, BG. You know what I'm saying? Welcome home to that man now. Were y'all yeah. crossing up with them at that time when y'all was on their run, when they was coming up and all that? Yeah, they was uptown, man. Uptown New Orleans, like a lot of things were walking distance. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people walk a lot, we used to follow those parades and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, Uptown, you know, everybody knew everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, from what KL told me, him and Birdman went to, you know, middle school together. You know mm. what I'm saying? So the Calio wasn't far from the uh, Ma- the, the uh, Magnolia. And the Parkway is like walking distance right into the Magnolia Project. So, you know, Slim, rest in peace, he's from, he from the Magnolia. So, oh, but that's a whole nother thing right there. Soldier Slim. Talk, talk about Soldier Slim a little bit. Bro. Slim, bro. Because he, he, people talk about him like the Tupac of New Orleans. He was. He is. Yeah. Long live Slim, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we commemorated him. Uh, Mac just had a 25-year anniversary of uh, Shell Shot, which was off the chain of the House of Blues. Shout out to Mac, bro. Uh, uh, one the most prolific, one of the p- most prolific MC that ever. Yeah, Mac don't use crazy. Mac don't, in my opinion, he don't. Crazy, use it. crazy. But Slim is another man. Slim had a work ethic. He had a charm about him. He was all New Orleans. He embodied New Orleans, especially Uptown New Orleans. Everybody loves Slim. When you, you say he embodied Uptown, what's Uptown New Orleans? What's that? Attitude? Uptown New Orleans is, you know, it's. I would say in New Orleans. I wouldn't, I, no disrespect for any of the downtown. So uptown would be the the the, the, the wards that's uh, before you cross Canal Street. Everything on the other side of Canal Street is going to be uptown. On the, uh, I would say the west side of Canal Street is going to be uptown, or they could be called north. I don't know the direction. But on the other side of Canal Street, east or, you know what I'm saying, south, that's going to be, you know, from the 6th, 7th, you know what I'm saying? Eighth, ninth, you know what I'm saying? But everything else is gonna be it's the, the walls are situated kind of weird. Because you got the third was next to the seventeenth wall. That's, that's what I was gonna say. I thought third and seventeenth was was Yeah, that that's crazy. You know how, how that's how that's how they zone that out. You got the eleventh, the tenth, the thirteenth and all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Then one point five gonna be across the river, you know what I'm saying, which is in Algiers, you know what I'm saying? One point five, which is fifteenth wall. But anyway, um, yeah, everybody knew one another, man. So, like, they grew up with one another. Like, uh, uh, Partners in Crime, they from Holly Grove. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Lil Wayne from Holly Grove. Fiend from Holly Grove. Uh, who else, man? A lot of them, man. Uh, you know, but then me and them from downtown. You know what I'm saying? But with that, there's a camaraderie ship. Between, you know, like the Juvies and the Slim, because they live, they're all from the, the Magnolia. You see what I'm saying? BG, you know what I'm saying? He's from out of the. Yeah, uh, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah Valens, you know what I'm saying? So uh, so is um, Mac, he's from the Uptown too. So KL was the go to guy for the beats, you know what I'm saying? And he was also a DJ. Him and Manny both DJed at this club called Rules. So a lot of those things, you know, the affiliation intersected and stuff. You know, it was all love. You know I'm saying it was just two different ideologies of the streets and music that Baby and P had. You know, what I'm saying none of the artists was had any uh, issues. With one another. Hmm. Man, okay, talk about uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to something else, but talk about the last done though, because they're thinking about you and all that. Even I know they derived from a you know. A, a classic, you know, bounce record already. But like, mm-hmm. talk about going in and making that. That was vague. I got vague memories of that. Be honest with you, 
because, like, I, once again, I was already... It was an album my, my, I was working on Gangster Harmony, mm. okay? And I was doing uh, a good portion of the album in L.A., okay? Oh, and you had went away. I went away to mm. do my album. You know what I'm saying? So I missed out on a couple of things there. You know, Snoop's album, I didn't have nothing on that, you know what I'm saying? But me and the Sons of Funk, we were in, because Sons of Funk helped me out a lot on that album, you know what I'm saying? Uh, to keep it musical and stuff like that. And they had a great sound. We had a good brotherhood. Shout out to Rico, shout out to Josh, you know what I'm saying? Greg, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Dance, he helped a lot on that as well. But uh, and they were great musicians. Those guys, were all of them were musicians, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Josh was the organist and stuff like that. But anyway, I'm in I'm in um, L.A. And um, so I remember P, when I first got a whiff of, uh, of, the, of the last time, of course, the artwork was already done in, in, the, in the inserts, the CDs and stuff. So while I'm working on that, um, he, he comes in on one of my sessions and like, cuz we stop wanting them to stop what you're doing type of thing, one of those type of scenarios again. So he comes in and, uh, um, you know, he spits to me like, you know, uh, I need you to sing this. A lot of those remakes was his idea, you know what I'm saying, especially for his projects, you know what I'm saying? And um, uh, he hit, cuz I need to sing the right that I hit it, you know what I'm saying? And um, uh, that was it, bro. You know what I'm saying? Got on the track, did that, you know what I'm saying? And um, made it happen, bro. So that was my, like I'm saying, very vague memory of that because I think that was, by him calling it last time, was like his last album that he was going to do, doing that phase of No Limit. You know, he was involved with the basketball and all this type of stuff. So, yeah, it was like his old merch. You know what I'm saying? Man, we talked about Ghetto D, but we ain't talking about Burbage and Lex, though, man. Bro. That Burbage and Lax, um, like, I, I always like Marvin Gaye, you know what I'm saying? And, like, I'm saying, like, sometimes I don't know where these uh, inspirations come from and at the time that they come. But, um, yeah, that that one there, bro. Uh, working in the studio, working on the uh, tracks, you know, we could we always had to be in creative mode. And we were working on that particular project, getting it done. So I was just fucking around. Like when I when I play, I usually play I play my favorite songs like I'm my own DJ, you know, on the keyboard. So, you know, got the SC one that was a a, a rack module uh, where a lot of sounds come from. I was gonna ask you what equipment you were using back then and all. We used rolling the rolling uh 2080, 4080. The, uh, of course, the MPC 60, the ASR 10, the SE1 was a uh, was one of those devices that K. Lou turned me and K. L. on. So we getting a lot of those. Uh, it's like a, a rack module synthesizer. You know what I'm saying? So had a lot of presets in there that that was some real good presets. Found that that one bass that boom 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 boom. You know i that's where that came from. So. Uh, I started playing because I just it just came to me, man. Like I don't know where that down. I guess the download came from the Most High. You know what I'm saying? Downloaded that to my brain. I put it into my fingers on that keyboard and started playing that and had to run, put that behind that, and uh, I came up with the hook. You know what I'm saying? And then P and uh, Silk and Lil Gotti from the um, you know the uh, Gambino family they just did their thing on that. You know, but that was, you know, I led, I led the charge on that with the concept because the bourbons and lacks come from our first, that concept come from me and KL's first vehicles that we got. When we was in he got a Suburban and I got a, a, a Sedan DeVille Cadillac. So that's what that song was all about. That's how we were riding. So, and it was really, that bass was for the, you know, for the, the sister for yeah. the trunk, you know what I'm saying? This is for the bourbons dun, and the Cadillacs with the tens and the twelve bumping in the back. So KL had twelves, I had tens. <laughs> you know no what I'm shit. <laughs> that, that was all about, bro. Yeah, that's crazy. That, that, that was inspired by. Yeah, 
And then you hear, play, oh, play, oh, I can't hit you on me. Yeah, that, you know, it's just a vibe, bro. It's a vibe, bro. And then he ended the album like, it was just a straight vibe, bro. Perfect way to end the album, dog. Um, bro. Yeah. Huh? Perfect way to end the album. Oh, yeah, man. I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was going to be like that, bro. You know, it was jamming. You know what I'm saying? Real so you making these records, you ain't thinking they finna be classics. Are there any one that you was like, nah, this going to be one? Or it was just like, just another day at, at the job, man. I had a feeling that was gonna be special. Really, I had a feeling about that. I can't lie. Mm. I'm gonna say that uh, that meal ticket. Mm. I had a good feeling about that because everybody who was on that, that's that's my most prized one. Meal ticket. Oh my God. Mm. P. U. G. K. A. Ball. Them. G. G. Yeah. Yeah. How you gonna lose? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All them boys doing what they do. You heard me. You know. P. Personal. Uh. Pimp C. Personal and Bun B, personal friends and brothers of mine till this day. Rest in peace, Pimp C, man. You know what I'm saying? Miss that dude. We had a real good brotherhood, like I'm saying. I actually, to make a long story short, I brought them boys to the table to No Limit. You know how, how did you meet? How did you meet them outside of No Limit? Uh, I, I was on a um, hyenas at a, for a short time. And nine, between 96 and 97, like I'll tell you, my cousin that I was... Uh, went in partnership with with Critical Condition, Starving Artist Entertainment. Um, you know, I was on a little high end. It took me a little break. I had to take one. You know what I'm saying? And um, uh, when I took that break, I got contacted by my cousin, Mary Young, Money Young, uh, my partner. And he was promoting shows at the time in Thibodeau, Louisiana. Bought them to do a show Came to uh, a rapport with them. And then, you know, they started working on the next Critical Condition album. He had bought in two new artists, you know what I'm saying? Wheelchair and Tech Nine. Another guy named Tech Nine from Thibodeau. That was his spillers. And uh, he hired Bun B as a, and Pimp C as ghostwriters and uh, Pimp C for the production, you know what I'm saying? So he had contact. They was almost finished with the project. And he said, man, I can't do this shit with, without Dick. So he contacted me and said, Dick, man, you know I got abundant. I said, huh? Can we, can when, they, when, they, when they put out that first album, man, with uh, Tell Me Something Good. That was on a whole nother project before it was on, uh, uh, what was the name of that album? With the Too Hard to Swallow. Too Hard to Swallow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a great historian, dude. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, by the time he got there, I said, yeah, I can't miss out on this, man. Working with, with my favorite group from the South. I, I can't miss out on this. So did that. Um, when I got hired for that, like I told him, you need anything from me, man? You know, you got the whole, you know, thing with uh, uh, starving artists that saw you. But if you need me from anything, I'm here for you. You know what I'm saying? So lived up to my word, went and did that, met up with them. So fast forward. A couple of weeks later, wind up fl flying back out to California. Uh, we were working on the Down South Hustlers then at this time. And um, once again, it's in there. And we, um, you know, P, I was like, P, say, bro, cuz, you working on Down South Hustlers. How you gonna do a Down South Hustlers album without UTK? So he kind of jokingly said, you got to you know how to get in contact with him? Like, you thought he didn't think that I had any contact with him. I said, matter of fact, I do. So I called my frat brother, who I was, uh, who was our um, manager, who was the manager for uh, Starving Artists at that time. And he said, yeah, I got a number on him. Because I, I didn't get the number when I did the beats with him. You know what I'm saying? He called him up. You know what I'm saying? So we got in touch, and, and um, they called me. The next thing you know, connected those dots. It was up then. That's when we did play it from the South Stack G's. Mm. Yeah. You know and that, that, that was both of y'all on production with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first collab. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Can, can, do you, is that something, because everybody got these Pimp C stories. Mm -hmm. What's your, what is your uh, impression of like Pimp when you're meeting him? Man? Is, he, is he on his thing or he was just real chill, you know? He was chill and he was also a comedian. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Dude was funny, bro, real mm. talk. So, but we, he was an intellectual comedian. Me and him had cracked, me and him and Bun cracked a lot of jokes. 
You know, it was cheaped a lot and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Then he had his brother Leroy, DJ Bird, you know what I'm saying? And, shout uh, out DJ had, Bird. Bro. Shout out to Bird, man. You know what I'm saying? That's that's still the brothers, you know what I'm saying? Later on came DJ Dolby D, you know what I'm saying? That was their traveling DJ. Shout out to DJ Dolby D out in Lafayette. You know what I'm saying? Church Park. You think it's somewhere around now. But anyway, um, we formed a good brotherhood, man. And we talked about a lot of things, you know what I'm saying, intellectually, you know what I'm saying, about life, you know what I'm saying? And you know, those are very brilliant guys, man, you know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, it was it was interesting to work with, with uh, Pimp C, man. And the second song that we did together was uh, Break Em Off song. People still play that to this day, and that still yeah, that, get that, the crowd going to this day. That's a joint. And shout out to uh, N.O. Joe. Has, N. O. Joe I just man. found out that he has something to do with that because him and N.O. Joe had a, really, a good working relationship, you know what I'm saying? Especially with that riding dirty and stuff. Mm -hmm. So N.O. Joe told me, I wish he was here to tell his own story, but he, but we had the conversation, I figured I could speak for him from what he told me. And he said, yeah, man, um, I had something to do with that. Cause he asked me when we, when we met about at the book uh, book signing the other day. He said, yeah, man, you, what, what part did you play on that? And I told him, you know what I'm saying? Wait, so 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 can you break that down? Can you break that beat down? Or who, or who had what parts on that? Well, the beat, the drums were already done. Mm -hmm. The bass lines were already done. The organ was already done. By the time I got to That was all pimp. Yeah, that yeah. was pimp and N.O. Joe from mm -hmm. now. I thought it was all pimp at one time, but you know, they know, I think they know had a lot to do. Had they they collaborated on the drums and the bass, and that that organ was all Pimp C. You know what I'm saying? But uh, and then I came in, bought them the the the, the chords, the Fender Rhodes chords, and bought that in there. You know what I'm saying? And like a rap. P came in there later on. Hustle ball against the pack. Cap Pillars, who I be, yeah. neighborhood drug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that became Big Moth something and it's still banging right now, bro. Y'all did that? Y'all did uh, Miss My Homies? I did the production. You produced all Miss My Homies? Yeah, except for the organ part. Hmm. Odell played the organ on there, but I get I got the production credit on there. Hmm. Odell played the organ, you know what I'm saying? Everything else I played, the drums, you know what I'm saying? But the, the organ was Odell. You know, he that he, he bruh, one of the best organs I've ever heard in my life. You know what I'm saying? And um a kick though. Kick though. Yeah, that was a collab between me, Pimp, Craig B, Odell, and KL. Mm -hmm. KL was on the drum. So said that was that was the yeah. That that Dell. Wait, so, so Pimp didn't have nothing to do with that production, you said? Yeah. Yeah, he was on there. Okay, yeah. That's what I'm saying, Pimp. Oh, yeah, got gotcha, Pimp, Pimp gotcha. was on there, you know. Pimp was on Oh, he played the lead on that one. He played the lead on that one right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, man, that was, a, that, was, that was a good memory right there. You know what I'm saying? So we, we just had fun on it, just went for what we know, and just, you know, just all of us would say, hey, hey, put some on it, put some on it. Do your thing, do what you do on that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, that was a good one, man. I played that. do 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 the, on the rock guitar sound, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. would be on that. Mm -hmm. oh, Y'all was really doing some jamming back then. Man. Oh, yeah, bro. We all, we, we, Pimp, Pimp was a musician himself. Pimp played trumpet, you know what I'm saying? He was a musician, man, so great musician. And um, me, me and Eno talked about this yesterday in regards to his vocal skills. Cause vo you know, he used to be singing under his breath a lot. I heard that dude say, say, dude, you need to start singing. You know, come to find out, you know, said, told me, told him the same thing, you know what I'm saying? So great minds thinking, like, and then I think from our suggestions, the combined suggestions of two guys from Louisiana, he took it and rolled with it, bro. Cool. Yeah, the boy's cold, man. So I rest peace, Pimp, one more time. You remember the last time you, you talked to Pimp? Yeah. Last time I talked to Pimp was in Wichita, Kansas. He had just gotten out of jail. And, uh, he started doing shows on his own. Him and Bum wasn't doing shows together. They weren't doing a lot of UGK stuff for whatever reason. But, uh, and I think Bun had his own project by the time. You know, K Pim, uh, KLC produ produced one on that as well. But uh, I was in Wichita, Kansas, and he had a show. 
in Wichita, Kansas. I opened up for him. I was the last opening act for him because Wichita is my stomach grounds, second home. Matter of fact, two of my kids were born in Wichita. Okay? So, we were waiting on PMP running late. They, got, they had to go get him from the airport in Oklahoma City. So he running a little late. So it's about 1.30 when he got there. I had, I had been like about 15 minutes done with my safe, so we just waiting on Pimp, Pimp to get there. So next thing you know, I hear, I heard my nigga Moby Dick in this motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> my nigga. You give a fuck? Because that's that everybody know me. For that was my infamous question. You give a fuck. If you knew Moby Dick back in the heyday, I would ask you, you know, you give a fuck? And my next question would be, you put it on him or you put it in him? Hmm. So he get he backed up. My nigga Moby Dick and his motherfucker, you give a fuck? You put it on him or you put it in him? <laughs> so everybody started looking at me. Yeah, that nigga know you. <laughs> I'm saying he know you. So so it was like a reunion, man. He got on there, but went backstage soon as I heard him because he had his mic in his hand and stuff like that. They had to call this mic. Went back there. You know what I'm saying? Long time. It's been a while because I hadn't seen him. Last time I saw him, right here in Houston, we, I forgot the name of him. Me and Joe were trying to uh, figure out what's the name of that studio. It was a big studio that everybody was recording at. Digital Service? Thank you, Mr. Digital Service. No, no, no. It was something else, man. This was before he got locked up? Before he got locked up, right before. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people was recording that, man. A lot of people, you know, a lot of the, you know, the grace used to come through that. But anyway, that was the last time I saw him. I think um, he was working on um, his the, uh, Sweet James Jones, you know what I'm saying? And um, that's the last time I saw him before he went to jail. But then I saw him again afterwards when he got out. And, uh, you know, it was a good reunion, man. And that was the last time I saw a pimp alive, bro. Mm. Last time I saw him alive, bro. And uh, missed that dude, real talk. Mm. Really miss him, mm. real talk. And Mama West, rest in peace, Mama West, sweet woman, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, go 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 back to, because, you know, y'all had this huge year in 98 at No Limit. Mm-hmm. And then it was like 99, I mean, cash money was coming up. And, it just, you know, seemed like y'all, you know, Beast by the Pound, or the original Beast by the Pound, you know, and kind of, y'all went y'all long way. Like, what was that whole thing about at that time? He was playing for, I think, Charlotte or something. Like, yeah, it was a lot going on. Did the, do you think the business just got too big? Or like, what? He, what? P was doing a lot of stuff, bro. He doing a lot. You know what I'm saying? P was getting getting him. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I ain't mad at that, but uh, one thing I can say, what, what, what made him... Master P was that music, real talk. It wasn't no basketball, even though he had that skill. And I think he wanted to live a dream, you know what I'm saying? So he used one thing for another to live that dream, you know what I'm saying? But it's, it was nothing like what got him now, you know what I'm saying? The marriage between, it was like a perfect marriage, Beast by the Pound and Master P. One wouldn't have existed without the other, real talk. Even though people say that, you know, anybody could rap the off them beats, but I, I, I beg to differ a bit because P had that energy and that voice that made you really love Beast by the Pound and No Limit. You know what I'm saying? You know, could things have done been done differently? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? You know, could things been handled differently? Absolutely. But we live and we learn. Mm. You understand what I'm talking about? Did y'all have a conversation at that time? Or like, man, we really want y'all with just music, man. We feel you on the basketball. We really want you. Or it was just... It was a disconnect. Mm. It was a disconnect between us. He, you know, he had been transformed into something else that we didn't know. You know what I'm saying? I'm his cousin. You know what I'm saying? It's just his blood, blood cousin. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't know him. You know what I'm saying? So, but he went, he went in a different direction. And, you know, uh, it panned out to where it ended with a disagreement. You know what I'm saying? On business and stuff like that. And he went his way. We went our way. You know what I'm saying? He did back and forth again. But then, you know, by the by time that, you know, he like, you know, man, let's work this out. You know what I'm saying? We, we was already burnt out. We was already like, you know, you know, you know, we can't do it on our terms this time. We did things on your terms, you know, forever. We can't do things on our terms this time. And, you know, then it's not going to work. And it didn't work. So we just moved forward, man. 
you know, he's still doing him, you know, we're doing us in our, in our individual lives, you know, uh, beast by the pound, you know, we tried the mess, the medicine man that ran as long as it did, but now, you know, life runs its course, man. You know, mm. the thing is now I don't live my life, uh, pointing the finger. I look at myself and feel like, okay, what can I've done better? You know what I'm saying? To better my personal situation. And I don't like to put my, my life in another man's hands. You know what I'm saying? So well, I wish everybody, you know, uh, success, happiness, you know, the pursuit of happiness is everything. You know what I'm saying? So I wish everybody that, man. Um, pray for pray for those who uh, had losses. You know what I'm saying? My little cousin, uh, P's daughter, passed away a couple of years ago. Rest in peace to her. You know what I'm saying? Romeo, he got kids now, you know what I'm saying? So shout out to him. Much blessings for him. Wish him wish him all the best, man. You know, free C murder, absolutely. Get him up out of that. C Miller, you know what I'm saying? Because they use that name against him so. and Mac. Lyrically, you know what I'm saying? I think Mac is working on something right now with the course to where they could stop using lyrics to incarcerate. Because in the in the movie theater, it's a different thing. You have Clint Eastwood out here knocking people's heads off and stuff like that. And they can uh, separate the horse from the person. Yeah. yeah, but they with hip hop, they 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 uh they weaponized it against us, especially with the prison industrial complex. So I'm on this thing called changing the narrative because we have more of us, our youth coming up missing, and not making it to see 30 years old, to live a ripe old days. Because our art form that we created in making billions of dollars for these corporations, you know what I'm saying? You know, they turned the, you know, turned the weapon on us, our own lyrics, and murking us with it, bro. Mm. So I'm, I'm with, you know, uh, with any type of uh, thing that we can get the youth to challenge them to speak about something else that's going to create lives versus taking lives. So therefore, I'm on this Change of Lyrics campaign. You know mm. what I'm saying? So I think that we could, it's a lot that we could learn from hip hop because like, like I'm saying, it is the industry. You know what I'm saying? The music industry composed of two different things that's going to make it successful. Okay? One is, it's a business. It's a music business, two components. Two things going to make it successful. And I think if you do the math and distribute the math uh, properly, where you take in consideration, number one, the business. Do 90% of that. The talent is going to always be there. Pac ain't here no more, right? I suppose it is. Uh, Big ain't here no more. You know what I'm saying? Slim ain't here no more. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a lot of us ain't here no more. Uh, rest in peace of Gangsta Boots, who's a good friend of mine. She ain't here no more. But guess what? Does the music business stop? It's going. Yeah, it's and going. them residuals still kicking in. Who getting the residuals? Mm. See what I'm saying? So we conduct the business and do that right. You know what I'm saying? Pay attention to that business. And my thing is, let's create lives, man. Let's make more lives. Let's uh, make our people accountable for those lyrics coming out their mouth. Think about how it's going, who it's going to affect and how it's going to affect and whether it's going to affect them in a positive light or a negative light. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I like to use that platform now, being an elder statesman from the 90s era, which I think is the golden era hip hop, you know what I'm saying? Let's turn this thing around because at one time it was empowering us. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to P Public Enemy. Shout out to Boogie Down Productions. You know what I'm saying? Putting some knowledge in there. Yes, yeah. put some knowledge, man. What is name KRS one? Yeah, still out here, man. Lionish reign supreme over nearly everyone. You see what I'm saying? Knowledge is power. So use this this vehicle to spread that knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Over the drum. You know what I'm saying? There was such thing in the old indigenous tribes called the speaking drum. Like that's where Morse code come from. So they, they would talk with the drum. You see what I'm saying? Thus it's hip hop. So mm. that that part right now. Man, do you I saw and I think it was an interview with B High. You were saying like you hadn't talked to P since like 99. Have y'all talked since then? This was an older interview, I think. Uh, yeah, um, we went, we've crossed paths. He invited me out to the uh, the first No Limit reunion that mm -hmm. was in 19, no, my bad, 2017 mm -hmm. and uh, at the Essence Fest. And, you know, I went there, you know what I'm saying? And um, 
it didn't go like, like I planned it to go or how we had talked about it. And that was the last time I talked to him. Mm. Well, talked to him, but but seeing him, it was at a, one of our cousins had got, matter of fact, murdered here, Kiva Herrera. You know what I'm saying, shout out to Kiva, your name gonna live on. Uh, that was uh, Big Ed's wife, which is my cousin, mm. P's first cousin. Her sister got murdered here, you know mm. what I'm saying? And, uh, and I saw him at her funeral. In New Orleans. That's the last time I saw him. Do you think, because I mean, UKL, you know what I'm saying? I don't know where Craig B is and uh, Odell and all them, but like, for the most part, y'all still around. Like, you ever think y'all could still put together compilations? The artist Fiend's still around, me is still around, you know, uh, Mystical, I'm sure, will be out sometime soon. Like, it's still some of y'all out here to be able to put that sound today, you know what I'm saying? Whatever that sounds like today with Beats by the Pound and whatever the No Limit. Artists, whatever they own at this time, would y'all ever do something like that? Like, hopefully, man, hopefully, man. You know, Kel, Mia, you heard that the man just put in a request, man. Donnie, he's one of our biggest supporters. Yeah, we, we want to get the people what they want. Now, I know me personally, I can speak for me. I definitely would love to get the people what they want. But uh, we could put that together. That would be great, man. Be I mean, I mean, y'all, I mean, you know, y'all still out here, man. Yeah, that that would be great. I, I would love to do that, man. You know, but like I know people like me, she's doing her cooking and stuff like that. They, people just in different places in their lives. We try, you know, uh, to do a couple of things with Beast by the Pound and the Medicine Men and stuff like that, and moving forward. You know what I'm saying? But there's other spaces that we could do that in. You know what I'm saying? And, um, yeah, hopefully we get to do something to get the people that special. I'm, I would love to see it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I would love to see that. Y'all heard the man. Y'all yeah. heard him. Diane has spoken. Diane Houston has spoken. Let's give it to him, man. You know what I'm saying? Whether in one shape, form, or another. You know what I'm saying? Whether P is with it or not, you know what I'm saying? That's one, you know, that's up to him. But uh, it's money in it. You know what I'm saying? Real talk. We could give, give him one more little thing, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. You well, know? man, you know, you got the book out with us. Is, is next for you, man. Oh uh, man, I'm working on another project, and um, that's gonna be out here soon. Um, collaborating with No Joe with some things, you know what I'm saying? My boy Damon, you know what I'm saying, with some things and stuff. You know, we got some things in the works right now. Um, yeah, man. Um, I also have some merch that's available on the website called VictorianaFarms.com, and uh, look, for, the book is on there. That's the main feature. But there's other things on there. Um, more music. Uh, getting into film, you know, scoring and stuff like that, getting more involved in this film aspect. Uh, the kids, mm. they need us, mm. especially, you know, doing things with uh, in different uh, scenarios with the kids. Like I'm saying, the, uh, change the narrative. You know what I'm saying? That's that's my big thing right now, to make sure we see these kids in the right direction lyrically because it's so powerful. And we want to give them life instead of them taking life. So that's that's my biggest concern right there. So that's for right now, you know, because my, my mind is always in the creative space. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm in the calling area as well. You know what I'm saying? My, my, I've been getting rave reviews over my cooking and stuff like that. So who knows? Something, something might pop up with that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, man, that's um, still being creative and still being uh, uh, grateful for being here. And God gave me another chance, man. I appreciate you on being on this platform. Man, that's like I told you when you came in, man. It's an honor, bro. I, I grew up wanting to be a No Limit soldier. I had to chain all this old shit, man. So, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, yeah, like I said, as far as a part of my life, like No Limit is the soundtrack. You know what I'm saying? So, Absolutely. It's an honor, man. All right, so moody, bro. All right. Yeah. For sure. It's yeah. Donnie's podcast, Moby Dick. Hey, man, we're about here. All right, let's go. Oh, yeah. Donnie Houston. Donnie Houston. Subscribe to Donnie Houston podcast, man.